Designed mainly by Kunio Okawar and drawing heavy inspiration from samurai aesthetics, the RX-78 II was born in 1979 and would revolutionize the mecha genre by introducing us to the real robots. Not unlike western heroes, it's composed almost entirely by the primary colors red, blue and yellow and almost half a century later, the simple yet striking head design continues to mesmerize all mecha fans. You can even say that if you combine a beefing, air vents in the mouthpiece and a red chin, you get yourself a Gundam inspired robot. But in reality, it's not that simple. Even today, with hundreds of robots wearing the Gundam insignia, there's still some confusion as to what is a Gundam. But don't worry, I have the absolute answer for that age-old question. If the robot has the name Gundam, then it's a Gundam. My name is Absa and subscribe to my channel for more super in-depth Gundam lore. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. It's very simple to identify a Gundam just by the name. And it's actually the best way since from the very beginning the Gundam design DNA has been ever-changing. In our chronology, the second Gundam was the Mark II, that looks like a beefier RX-78, yet the third was the Seda, who looks absolutely nothing like the RX-78 II. Even the always evolving Valkyries from Macros have a more consistent DNA. So yeah, trying to answer the age-old question, what is a Gundam, is almost as complex as asking what is a human. But given the fact that I like to overthink everything, let's take a look at the RX-78 II Master Grade version 3.0, a modernized Gundam design inspired by the 1 to 1 scale statue that was in Odaiba. Let's go somewhat in depth on its design history and how, by using certain elements of Japanese folklore and a little bit of executive meddling, the original Gundam silhouette became so iconic. If you ask any non-Mecha fans what a Gundam is, they most probably will be able to answer. But if you ask them to name a specific Gundam, they most probably will not be able to answer it. And that's because the visual identity of almost all Gundam robots, especially the main ones, are very similar. And it's not like they're identical, but there are very specific concepts that make the so-called Gundam robots a Gundam model suit. I already talked about the blue and white colors with red and yellow highlights. In addition, the main Gundams show similarities almost equal to those that exist on siblings. Each one is slightly different and for someone who is not very familiar with them, they will look pretty similar. Even going all the way in saying that the face is exactly the same in all of them. A mouthpiece with two air vents, two eyes and some sort of helmet with a V-shaped frontal fin, the now famous V-fin. However, these design similarities between robots are not accidents nor laziness coming from the mechanical designers. All those details are completely intentional and actually come from the first design of the original gun, the RX-78 II, all done by history's first mechanical designer, Kunio Okawara. From Oli Barter's Forbes fantastic interview with Kunio Okawara, Studio News' initial design influence came in the form of the gun cannon and this was done by Kasutaka Miyatake, says Okawara. I proposed the Gundam instead. In the process of coming up with the Gundam, there were ideas from a great many people reflected in the final design. So it's not like a single-handed thing. What I proposed for the Gundam was basically a samurai. So the head had a Chun Mage at the top with a face and a Maedate in the form of a beefing. It was also meant to be 18 meters tall and as such the face and mouth was a little bit strange so we put a mask over the mouth. Going a little bit more in depth into the design elements of the samurais, the head 
or at least the helmet that covers the head was inspired by the Kabuto of the samurais, but it would also have a Chon Magi along it. This is a type of haircut that resembles a top knot above the head, something like the man bun but longer and closer to the head. In addition to that, the head would also be adorned with a metal or frontal crest with a V-shaped fin directly above the forehead. And since in the anime the robot was going to measure about 60 feet, a human figure of that size with face and mouth was probably going to look very strange. So that's why they decided to use a main paw or mouthpiece like that of the samurai to cover its face. And here's where things get interesting. The reasoning behind those design elements within the internal electromechanics of the robot. The B-shaped fin is actually an antenna. The two eyes are actually a pair of cameras that, along with an auxiliary camera on the top knot, serve to faithfully represent the three-dimensionality of the terrain on the cockpit monitors. The red chin is a listening device and megaphone that supposedly was painted red to make the robot look much more threatening. Also, another super iconic design element of the Gundams are the two lines that appear in the mask, almost exactly where the nose should be. These are actually a pair of air vents that are placed there to help cool down the two Vulcan guns of the head along with the radiators that are placed on the sides of the helmet, which in turn also happen to look like a modernized version of the neck guard or shikoro of the Japanese samurai helmet. Now as to why exactly two vents, that I don't really know. The story goes that it was character designer Yoshikazu Yasuhiko who wanted to stay away from the super robot trend of human-like faces in robots, so it was him who gave the robot a mask. Maybe Yasuhiko or Okawara took note from the two nostrils that we have on our nose and with that they made the Gundam covered face seem somewhat familiar in contrast to the overall weirder mono-eyed Saku. With that in mind, the Gundam face design became so iconic to the franchise that many years later most of the robots that have the name Gundam attached to it have some sort of beefing on the forehead, the mouth covered by a mask with bends and a somewhat samurai inspired helmet. But like everything, over the years the design trends have changed and in 2009 Okawara's design jumped from the anime to real life with the first one-to-one -one real size Gundam in Japan. The new designer attached to the project was Masaki Kawahara, who would in fact return for the Unicorn and the Yokohama version of the RX-78 II. Kawahara redesigned the silhouette for it to be less blocky and much more modern. You can even say that he gave the Gundam more human-like proportions with a triangular upper body enhanced by the wider shoulders, longer legs and even a more stern look to the face instead of the elongated one from the original anime. So to finalize this exploration of the Gundam design, let's take a look at the rest of the silhouette of the Master Grade version 3.0, the kit inspired by the 1 to 1 scale statue. Originally, Tomino wanted for the Gundam to be white and grey since it was a military machine. But the head honchos of the toy companies found that color scheme too boring. A purely white mobile suit came many, many, many years later with the RX Zero Unicorn Gundam. But that's for another time. So, keeping in line with the superhero color schemes from the West, the Gundam was emblazoned with the primary colors reserved for the protagonist heroes, and the enemies got the secondary colors. That may be one reason why the Sakus are green, except Char's commander type, but that's also for another time. Anyway, 
There's early concept art where the Gundam used color schemes more akin to classic super robot patterns made up of red, yellow and blue and grayish silver for the more metallic parts. And let's just say that in practice they look absolutely toyish. Yasuhiko was the one that came up with the final color scheme that included the primary colors but in a much more elegant fashion. The robot is still mostly white, with some accents in yellow that help some parts pop a little bit more. The red is mostly used for the obliques and the blue stays in the chest. And something funny happens when you tweak a little bit the location of the primary colors. Can you guess it? Yes, some of the variant mobile suits of future stories can be identified just by changing the colors of the RX-78 too. Now, the 3.0 kit does a great job in dividing the white parts into different hues ranging from pure white to almost grey. That, along with the panel lines, makes the Gundam look much more modern. Kawahara was able to keep the same silhouette of the original RX-78 2 but make it more contemporary by separating the long panels that appear on the legs, arms and shoulders, and with that the Gundam seems much more dynamic, with much more movement capacity. It's almost as if those lines mimicked the fibers of her muscles, with the Gundam now looking more like a humanoid war machine instead of a toy. He went even further with the newest redesign of the RX-78 2, the RX-78 F-00 Gundam in Yokohama, but I don't have that model kit, so I won't talk about it. Another thing that I haven't talked about is the core block system, particularly the core fighter. In most of the newer adaptations it's not really emphasized to the point of almost being entirely ignored, yet the 3.0 does include it and you can even use it as part of the Gundam's trunk or leave it outside. I prefer to keep it outside since first you can look at it and second the Gundam unit is more stable this way. And in a super interesting side note, Shoji Kawamori, the designer of the Valkyries, has a very peculiar opinion of the core block system. In another great Olivarder interview he talks, Gundam did not seem to use the core block system in an effective way. That meant the core fighter couldn't be used once all the parts were combined. From my point of view as a mecha designer, that was really disappointing mechanically. Generally speaking, a fighter yet has a lot more horsepower than land-based weapons, such as a tank. Fighter jets might be 100 to 200 times more powerful than land-based weapons if their weight was the same. So for my design of the GP-01, I made the engine block of the fighter the backpack on the body and this contributed to the bulk of the mobile suit's thrust. So now we know why the Sephirantis Core Fighter 2 system looked quite different. But the Yet Fighter idea originated here, from the earliest Tomino's Gunboy proposal and Okawara's Fighting Vehicle Freedom Wing design to its subsequent final form, the Core Fighter Support Escape Capsule. And since this video has been going for quite a while now and I don't want to bore you anymore, let's quickly move to the silhouette in action. Some of the most iconic poses use the Vim Sabers, a weapon most definitely inspired by the lightsabers from Star Wars, and something not really seen in previous giant robots, a very big and bright shield that allegedly has its design roots in police riot gear. We also have the Beam Rifle and the Hyper Bazooka, but my personal favorites have to be the Beam Sabers. And this exploration wouldn't be complete without the most iconic of the iconic, the Gundam's last shooting pose.
To say that the RX 70A2 has an iconic silhouette fails to capture the marvelous figure and shape that would inspire countless other mechas from the same franchise and even others. The original Gundam's history is very interesting since it is quite a mashup of Japanese folklore, super robot tropes and even some western pop culture. Many, many years ago I tried to cover the entirety of the stylistic evolution of the Gundam franchise and even though it was ok, I was not truly satisfied with the way I presented the information there. Since that time my knowledge has greatly improved and I have built many more Gunpla. Which brings me to the next point. Generally speaking, Gunpla reviews only cover the build, accessories and articulation portion of the kits. And for the most part that's ok. You really don't need to know who designed or redesigned the robot for you to experience joy while building it. Yet for me, having a background in engineering and absolutely no idea how to paint, draw or even design, it's fascinating to see how something that started as a drawing by a brilliant designer transforms into a set of runners that when you piece together they actually form that same drawing but now in three dimensions. So now not only do we have the original drawing with all of its concept history but on top of that we have a modern 3D reproduction that also carries all of its history and even adds to it. That's why I decided to include all of the history of the mobile suit instead of talking about the things that normal Gunpla reviewers talk about like articulation, accessories etc. And before you ask about why I left the Gundam without decals, well that's because I wanted to analyze the design just as it appeared in the anime. Which is really a very fancy way of saying that I'm a very bad Gunpla builder with super super clumsy hands. I originally intended to do this kind of exploration with a real great line, starting obviously with the granddaddy. But then I realized that some of the UC Gundams were not available yet, like the Double Zeta for example. And also many of the early real grade kits are not so readily available. So I decided to first complete all of the original Universal Century designs with the master grade kits and maybe then, if you like the series, I'll move on to the real grade line. Also, this wouldn't have been possible without people like Oli Butter from Forbes, BJ from Psionic Scans and Ultimate Mark and many other people who translate or even directly talk with the original creators. And finally, I may be wrong in some things, I don't speak Japanese and some other things are what I could interpret from the way the kit was constructed. So yeah, if I'm wrong on something, please go ahead and leave it in the comments. Also tell me if you liked the video and considering that it's the first of this series, what else would you like to see for the Mark II exploration? And as you may or may not know, my name is Absa and we can continue the conversation over at Twitter where you can follow me at Absalonicus and on Instagram where I post pictures of my figures, my cats and sometimes even myself. So till next time, always remember that in fiction lies power. So let's use it to forge a new type of story, our hero's journey.